here and welcome to part two of the how to scan your artwork series. <laughs> part two meaning we will actually use some proper editing in an editing program. Yeah. Now, let me be honest right from the start, I had a different idea about the direction this video should be going in, but when I've recorded the footage, and that's the footage you are seeing right now, it was over an hour long. And I tried my best to cut it, but I just I just couldn't. I, it was not possible. So while I'm watching, uh, you know, while, while while we are talking, you're gonna be watching me editing some stuff in the background, because yep, yeah, that, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> now, as a disclaimer, let me mention that whatever I'm talking about here and showing you is not the one truth, and there is probably ways to do it easier or to do it better, or just simply, you know, different. This is just what works for me and for my paintings, and, and that's pretty much, you know, all I need. However, if you have any ideas or things I could improve, or just, you know, you want to share your process, you know, feel free to say that in the comments below. I'm always happy to share experiences and to just, you know, swap, you know, ideas. That's, that's really, I love that part of, you know, the YouTube community. Okay, so let's get started. In my personal opinion, the editing of your scanned artwork is not really about changing it, but about adjusting your scanned image so that it looks like the original piece of artwork. That's why I made part one, which was all about scanning your image and getting the best possible result so that you don't actually have to edit all that much. It's really important. On the screen, you can see two versions of the same scan that we've worked uh, on in part one. On the left, uh, you have an earlier one that I wasn't happy with because of those you know, big shadows in the upper portion of the picture. On the right, I made sure to put more pressure on the paper to flatten it out and the resulting image is you know, much more even and easier to edit. I put a lot of effort <laughs> into getting the best scan I can because I want the scanner to do the majority of the work for me. The first thing I do when editing any file is to duplicate the layer, uh, you know, the background layer, and save the file as a temporary working file. You know, or not temporary, it's, it's really up to you. You know, save it often. <laughs> There's nothing worse than losing all your work when your editing software, you know, stops working or there is a power outage, which was actually true in, you know, both cases for me. So it's really important to save often. I work with an older version of Photoshop, but I imagine that any really editing software with similar options will work just fine. I just happen to have it, this one. It's just a matter of learning, you know, how to take advantage of, you know, w whatever that program has to offer. I'm also assuming that you have the basic knowledge of either Photoshop or whatever product program you're using. Uh, and if you have any problems or you don't know how something works, use Google or YouTube. There's literally thousands of videos and articles that show you how to do basic, you know, Photoshop stuff. That's how I <laughs> learned everything pretty much. So yeah, it really works. After saving my file, I changed the color profile to CMYK uh, in the convert to profile window in the edit menu thing. <laughs> the CMYK is the color profile that printers use, the big printers and it has much smaller range of color than RGB, which is the color profile used by you know, digital displays. If you edit your file in RGB, chances are that your colors, especially blues and greens, always in my case, you know, the colors will be washed out and you will have to adjust them again, which is a waste of time. If you start with CMYK, you can convert it later to RGB for internet use and it will look exactly the same. But you will already have the CMYK, which is, you know, for, for bigger printer, printers, <laughs> if you want to use that image for printing. Now, which CMYK profile to choose is a still, you know, bit of a mystery for me. So I'm not going to go into detail um, that much. And I encourage you guys to do your own research you know, or share some thoughts in the comments, because that's really one part of the whole editing process that I'm still not exactly 
sure about. There are a lot of profiles in Photoshop, so I just tend to Google the CMYK ISO standard for whatever country the file is supposed to go to, you know, if I if I do it for, for a client. And that just that just works. It works so far. I work on only one of my two layers. And that's just my personal preference because I really like to be able to see the image before and after the edits. You know, like you click it to be visible or not and it just shows you the change. It's, I like that. It's fun. <laughs> okay. It's all there is to that. It's just fun. <laughs> Plus, I can always come back to the original if I mess something up. It's always good to have a backup. Before I do any color adjusting, I always clean up my picture from any specks of dust that got in the you know, that got on the f surface during the scanning. That's why it's so important to clean up your scanner because it's re you really don't want to spend hours, you know, doing this, this chore, really. It might also not be as important to you as it is to me because I've recently taken to scanning my images re in really high resolution so that I can print them bigger than they were scanned. Uh, I came to uh, to just like it, just like being able to see all the brush strokes and you know the gritty textures. You know that's why I make sure to that every bit of dust is gone from the scan, because while it might not be visible in original size, it will be in the print. You know when the when the print is bigger, <laughs> so that's why I do it. Another good tip is to make sure not to zoom in too much. You have to remember what the original is, like what the the end size, the end result is going to be. Now, if you're like me and you like to have it big, then of course you're going to go into like a big zoom in to 100% and that's what you're going to work on. But if you, for example, have an A4 scan that you're going to print as an A4, then whatever you have on the on your monitor, just have a little like an A4 sheet of paper and just kind of see if it's approximately the same size as the you know image on your display and you can see if if things are visible or not you know it's it's just kind of saves you time in the long run that's just a good tip that i, I use personally as well so for cleaning up the background and pretty much anything in the picture i always use the clone stamp tool you can find it in the in the tools on the side i use a soft one just a soft brush with a lowered opacity about 50 60 percent so that everything kind of blends in nicely i never erase the texture of the paper either you know if there is any uh, because i like it i like the texture i've uh, i've learned to accept it and it's really impossible to get rid of it completely it's just something that needs to be accepted and if you want minimal texture then you will have to start with the paper well, you know, I ended up loving the texture <laughs> as time went by. That's one of the reasons why I always use hot pressed paper, because it's much easier to scan and you get like this much flatter result. The next step is using the levels option for adjusting the light and the dark parts of your image. And now I know that some people use curves. I, I just like levels better. It's just a choice. There's, <laughs> there's really nothing behind it. The gist of it is that your painting got washed out during the scanning, it's completely flat. So you want to manually adjust the contrast. That's what we were talking about in part one, that we didn't want the scanner to do it because it doesn't have that subtlety, especially if it's a cheap scanner like mine. So that's when you're actually going to be bringing back the contrast. You want to move the little arrows that you have in the levels window. You want to move them around until you have brought up a little bit of definition back to your painting. A good starting point is indicated by the curvy shape, you know, the one above the arrows. And you have to remember that a little bit goes a long way. It's really easy to overdo it, so it's always a good idea to have the original in front of you for comparison. It's also a very good idea to, whenever you're adjusting something, you have to remember that the printed picture will look different than whatever you see on the monitor. So it's a very good idea to print occasionally, especially if it's a very important print and you're going to run a big, you know, print party, like, you know, as in 
as in a lot of prints. You're gonna print a lot of prints. Ha! Huh. <laughs> so you have to really invest into the proofs. You have to be make sure to print once in a while when you make those changes. You have to print uh, just a, a version and then adjust accordingly. Because sometimes on the monitor, you're gonna see certain things to be dark, but they're gonna look washed out uh, in your printed picture. Just bear that in mind, because that's something I learned the hard way in the very beginning of the very first prints that I've ever made. And I've ordered a lot of prints without proofing them, and they were just unusable. So, yes, proof your image. <laughs> oh, and you can also untick the little preview box you know, to compare the before and after so that you don't have to commit to it and go, go back and, you know, redo it. Um, it's really handy. <laughs> if your colors are washed out or changed and changed slightly, they should be changed only slightly if you did the scanning, you know, properly. You can use the hue, you know, slash, hue slash saturation option. Uh, in this case, it wasn't really necessary in the case of this sketch, but for example, the recent turtle painting that I um, that had a lot of blue and green in it, you know, it needed a bit more of a hue adjustment because the scanner didn't quite catch all the different shades. You know, just a little tick of the hue, and all the teals were back and you know in the painting, and there was a clear distinction between the blue and the and the greens. So it's just, you know, editing is really a case by case kind of a thing. You know, the carrots didn't need much change in levels, but the shiny bunny painting uh, did, you know? It's all about the colors you use and the medium you use. The more transparent the color is, the harder it will be to scan it. And that's why the shiny bunny, which was painted with more opaque Arteza watercolors, had almost the exact color match. It was a really, really satisfying thing to, to scan. It's a similar thing with gouache. The gouache is just amazing to scan. On the other hand, the Turtle Legends, um, the, I use my regular watercolor set for those, which is a really transparent set. I have a lot of transparent colors. And those delicate tones, you know, that I use the little um, glazings and stuff, they were much harder to read because the light of the scanner didn't have anything to bounce off of. <laughs> the last thing I do is to bring the white bits back to being white. I never try to make the white bits, you know, you know the quote unquote white bits, you know what I mean. I never try to make them white with levels or contrast because the white on paper is never completely white. Our eye will read you know, it, as white, but it always picks up a bit of pigment from underneath, and it's also a little bit transparent. Also, gouache has this tendency to create shadows while <laughs> being scanned because, you know, it's thick. I lay it usually very thick, and I, I, I actually layer it. I can layer a, a couple of, of different layers of gouache just to build up that, you know, fade out effect, or sometimes I'm really angry <laughs> with the gouache, so I'm gonna just slap it on thick, and it will, it will create a shadow because some areas are raised, you know, and, and because of that, I want to see on screen what I see on the paper. So I take a regular brush and I paint over the white bits to make them, you know, nice and shiny again and bright. I don't alter the shape because it's very important for me to actually have the scan to be as close to the original as possible. I just paint on top of them. You might want to use a new layer for that too, just, just to be on the safe side, you know? <laughs> and depending on the painting, uh, this can really take a while. The recent painting I did with the bioluminescent beach that had a lot of those little white dots, that thing was just a nightmare <laughs> to, uh, to do because there, there was just so many white little dots that I had to paint over. But that's just, you know, that's just one of those things that you have to do. After everything is edited and I'm happy with what I see, I flatten the image and save it in a couple of different ways. I really like to have a CMYK PSD, like a PSD file <laughs> uh, for prints. 
and then uh, so that I can store it. I store them. I store all my all my files in a separate, um, just like one of those. How do you call them again? Like hard drives, like the external hard drives. <laughs> um, so I I definitely have like a CMYK PSD for that. And then I also save, uh, I convert it to an RGB um, as a last step. And then I save it as a PNG in a big format from which I pretty much work for anything. If I want to make it smaller, I really make it small for internet use. But for example, I make it a little bit more big, higher quality for Etsy uh, because that's, you know, for sale and I want people to be able to see. So that's a really good starting point uh, to have. And that's it. That's really the gist of it. I hope you've enjoyed this video and that you've learned something. And if you have any questions or comments or would you you would like to share, like I said in the beginning, would you like if you would like to share your own experiences and tips, please leave all the comments below. You know, and good luck with experimenting. <laughs> um, bear in mind that this is really just it requires practice. Um, this is just something that you start working out for yourself and it takes some adjusting and there is a learning curve. Seriously, I've always thought about uh, editing photos like, as a form of art because it really is. It's just, you know, a little bit less creative. It, well, sometimes it actually can be creative, but that's, that's something that's for another video. <laughs> for now, thank you so, so very much for watching and being for, here with me and supporting me. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.